Welcome to Sober Smash. Sober Smash. Sober Smash. Get to the core issues with King Scott and Dr. Joe. And get Sober Smash. Welcome once again to Sober Smash Live with our special guest today. He is an addictionologist, he is a specialist, he's a psychotherapist, he's got too many things to mention in this, John Hawkins, and now our host, the intelli- most intelligent man in podcast, King Scott and Dr. Joe. All right, thank you, Pardo. John Hawkins, what an honor it is to have you in front of us today, buddy. Thank how you. you how you doing? Good. Good to see you. You're filled with knowledge in that head of yours, and we're about to unravel it today. Uh, John is probably one of the best in the industry, if not the best in the industry, as an EMDR therapist. What do you think about that, Dr. Joe? I tell you what, EMDR is a strange, funny combination of letters, but uh, it's really a revolutionary advance in therapy and helping individuals clear out difficulties they have and move on to a greater level of functioning. Good afternoon, Mr. John Hawkins. Good afternoon. John, can you tell us, uh, everyone out there that's listening, uh, what is EMDR therapy? What does it stand for? Um, The acronym is um, Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing. Uh, About 30 some years ago, a woman named Francine Shapiro was a professor, uh, so the story goes, she got diagnosed with cancer and was walking in a park in San Francisco, very distressed. Something caused her eyes to flutter back and forth, and she felt this tremendous sense of relief. And being a professor, she said, you know, what the heck was that about? And she got a team of researchers, and I think concurrently there was a project going on studying dreams. So we now know conclusively what dreams are. Um, Your brain is taking in your life experience, emotions, and processing into your memory system to an adaptive resolution. And so she figured out accidentally a way to tap into the system where no matter what you've been through, trauma, addiction, negative experiences, everything zeroes out. So when we're dreaming, our eyes are going back and forth, the rapid eye movement sleep. Right, right. And so that's kind of the nuts and bolts of the description of it. And who would you say is a, you're primarily a, the right candidate for EMDR therapy? Who is that person? Uh, For me, everybody. Um, Everybody can benefit from it. Um, I think, you know, one of the reasons I'm here working with you guys is um, trauma and addiction are my big passions. Right. And I feel like uh, EMDR is, you know, one of the most impactful therapies I've ever found. And a lot of treatment centers say they do it, but I think it's extremely underutilized. People are probably only getting about 10% of what they could be getting from it. And the early research on EMDR and addiction um, is through the roof. It's just kind of a burgeoning thing. Even though people have been doing some things with it, like I said, it's it's never been totally utilized. Right. right. Or people have a lot of misconceptions. Like, it started as a trauma-based therapy. So a lot of people think, well, clients first coming into treatment aren't capable of any of those things, and so they'll shy away from doing it. Well, I have to say from our from my experience, you know, knowing you for some years now, um, and speaking to clients that you're in sessions with, I think the greatest response I hear from the treatment center is I got so much out of John Hawkins with EMDR, it really changed my life. And I hear that from so many clients daily, which is phenomenal. Yeah. It's great. You know, um, do you agree with that, Joe? Absolutely. I met John a number of years ago, and um, it's just amazing how the clients go through a session with him and come out feeling relieved, feeling a sense of control, feeling a greater sense of being in touch with who they are in a very non-threatening way, by the way. So it's a real testament to how people are getting helped. Yeah, I have, I have to agree with that. Um, tell us what a normal session is like. You know, I, I come in to see you. What happens? Um, you know, first I'm going to kind of assess what you're coming in to see me for, a presenting problem uh, with meeting new clients here. Uh, you know, I have one of the luxuries where I don't have to have a set treatment plan, but I can try to benefit 
them in whatever way possible that's going to give them the most impact while they're here. So you basically tailor the session to the individual. Exactly. So, you know, clients, particularly in a treatment setting, are coming in with quite a list of things right. they have to work through, and they've got a very limited amount of time. If I have a, you know, a client outside of treatment, I can see them for several years to work through a lot of these extensive traumas and things like that. And I think EMDR should be a much uh, more front and center treatment modality. You can do things in one session that would take you minimum six months in talk therapy to do. I have a good example was a woman who came to see me a little over a year ago. She'd gotten uh, PTSD from a car wreck. And so for six months, she hasn't been able to drive. Every time she tries to drive, she gets a panic attack. So she'd been weekly talk therapy for six months. Uh, somebody referred her to me because of my you know, EMDR and trauma work. I got some information about the wreck. She discussed it. We did 25 minutes of EMDR. She was driving that afternoon. That's phenomenal. Listen, if anyone does have any questions for John or anyone here, uh, remember we are live on Facebook. You can write the questions or you can phone in and uh, we'll make sure that we try to answer every question that you do have. John loves answering questions. So so with that, John, um, what if someone's afraid of their feelings and, and tapping into them, afraid they'll be overwhelmed? How would you address that in the EMDR session? Well, that would be then your initial target. Rather than working on things, you'd work on their fear of working on things. And so you'd want to reduce that until they had no fear, and then you would take the step to go work on those things. So there's always a place to work from. There's never a standstill, never a, a dead end. Um, and in the beginning, especially with trauma clients, the strategy is to really build them up, not to go take on negative places from a negative place but to find the resources that they, they possess. I mean, if somebody's been through you know, horrible traumas for 20 years, they're sitting in front of me. So they've got strengths and resiliencies that we can build off of that maybe they don't identify, but they got them through all that stuff. So we want to take those and just expand them, get them really blown up, and get them you know, really tapped into their capacities before we start you know, inching into the other stuff. But it's really just taking... When you have a phobia like that, and if you try to go to people's core issues, all you're going to do is increase the phobia. And I think one of the things I've learned over the years as a therapist is slow down, where a lot of times people are just going way too fast, particularly with EMDR. A lot of feedback I get from clients who had EMDR in another treatment center is they want right for their traumas, blew them out of the water, and they never want to go work on that. So it's basically overload. Yeah, That's I mean, it is. it's a real powerful yeah. thing tapping into yeah. the system. Right. So you have to really assess these client and know that you're creating more trauma. Yeah, you're re-traumatizing yeah. for sure. Right. Uh, how, how long of a process is EMDR therapy? Uh, I don't know if there's considered an average. Um, let's say somebody's in treatment thirty to sixty days. How many sessions would you advise them to have, or how long would it take to say you know this process is really working for this individual? I think pretty much right from the get-go. I mean, from session one, I want things to be happening. And there's a lot of factors that kind of play into what people are capable of. A single incident trauma, it, a lot of times it's just one session. I mean, it could be a rape, a car wreck, a gunshot, but it was confined to a single incident. Complex traumas where maybe there was recurrent abuse, neglect, things like that throughout childhood and adolescence. Um, are longer, but they're a lot minimal compared to what traditional therapy would be. And then you're looking at things like their attachment history. You know, did they have anyone in their life who was a responsive emotional person? That's the biggest shock absorber against trauma, secure attachment. And so you're, even if they didn't, there's ways to start to internalize that and build that up and, you know, like I said, increase their capacities in the beginning. And one of the things with, with the MDR and trauma is you know for me it's really big to individualize every client you know and that's again one of the reasons um i'm collaborating with you guys and like coming in here is that's the idea and the approach is that each client's different and you have to tailor things to them so there's clients that can't process major trauma for months there's other clients that can process something the first day they walk in the door and it's a shame to withhold treatment to somebody like that just because of a general rule you know, so it's it's really dependent on each individual person. I mean, it could be one session, right, months right. worth. Or. Can, can you actually describe 
in detail pretty much what EMDR is, mm -hmm. how it works, what makes the wheels turn? Really what happens is, you know, as human beings, we have this, this massive memory system. And we have two types of memory. We have explicit memory, which is, okay, I remember doing this today. I remember driving here this morning, getting dressed. And then we have what's called implicit memory, which is more body emotional memories. And these are the real stuff we're trying to go after in therapy. They're not in conscious awareness a lot of the times. You can come to therapy and talk about stuff and be completely disconnected from that. Right. So you could go to therapy for 20 years and nothing's going to happen. I just call it, I call it throwing words in the air. You know, and people have all kinds of insight. Yeah, I get it. I know exactly why, but I don't feel any different. So it really has to be experiential. So all throughout our lives, we go through different experiences, negative experiences, traumatic experience. Drug use gets stored in the brain similar to a trauma. So when we have strong feelings come rushing through, everything comes through the body first. Then it comes up and, you know, we want to get kind of a cognitive reappraisal of what all that feeling is. It sounds like you at a Mexican restaurant, <laughs> Dr. Joe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Much different. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the brain evolved three ways to deal with those overwhelming feelings. Because if they come all the way through, they'll give the brain nerve damage and cell death. So to protect the brain, the most advanced is what we call secure attachment. I reach for somebody emotionally, physically, they respond to me. The second's fight or flight, so the energy gets discharged through fighting or fleeing. The third's the most primitive one we um, have that we share with animals as well, and humans we call it disassociation. So that's the number one issue for me in therapy, is we split off to cope and adapt, I mean, just a thousand different things. It could be an unacceptable thought, it could be trauma, it could be my anger, a part of myself. So really underlying the heart of addiction or any compulsive behavior is dysregulated emotion that spins me out into this part of my brain, pushes me into my limbic system or brainstem, and says go. That part of the brain just knows act, think about it later. So it doesn't matter how sincere you are, how committed you are to your recovery, you disconnect from that part of the brain. And that's the thing people vastly underestimate. So in EMDR, what we're doing is we're going and getting access to that disassociated stuff and now reintegrating it to a completion so it's not there anymore. So it's not about managing symptoms, but about symptom resolution. So now the person uh, you know, can regulate some of these feelings that come through because they're not coming with trauma or you know, a lot of anxiety. I got a question here from Karen42. She wants to know, does EMDR work for everybody? It works for everybody. If you are a human being, it works for you. If you have ever dreamed, it works for you. So every human being has a system. A lot of the complaints I'll get from clients is maybe they tried EMDR with someone um, and they say, oh, it didn't go well, it didn't work. In the beginning as an EMDR therapist, you know, there's some basic simple protocols and things. But really, when you start working with a lot of complicated cases, you have to understand a lot of the nuances. And I think like any model, people get uh, too married to the model, too big of an adherent and get rigid with it. So you still have to really individualize it and not be so rigid with it. You know, where so they say, I might have a client who goes to processing immediately. I might have another client where I have to talk to them for three sessions to build mm -hmm. rapport and safety before we go anywhere. And that's the, I think a lot of times I have to overcome people's earlier negative experiences. So it's not, you know, it's kind of like saying I have a car, but that doesn't mean you're a good driver now. Right. right. You know, so it's, um, it's just really with experience, really getting to understand little nuances of it, you know, but it definitely works for everyone. There's a lot of blocks that come up for people which then become part of the work. So you know. I guess, you know, some people might get more than others out of it. Yeah, I think depending on what you work on, everybody will benefit. It, it really it goes can back be, to being individualized. Yeah, it, it can be, re I mean, it's, you have sessions that are just life changing in one right. session. And what happens is, you know, all these defenses that we have to develop to cope with life, some people have a lot more defenses. And so it takes them a little longer to get dropped down in, but they'll drop just like everybody else. If they can just be open minded and kind of, hang in there where other people can, you know, just kind of drop earlier. Yeah. Can you describe, you know, uh, this is, I'm sure a lot of people can ask this question. How does the eye movement work in the therapy? Um, what, there's so much research around EMDR because in the beginning, uh, 
you know, nobody, everybody discounted it. That there's no, it's ridiculous. Like moving sure. your eyes back and forth. I thought it was complete crap. You know, I was like, come on. So my clients who had had it and convinced me and other clinicians I respected. So I finally went and got trained. And it was everything people said. So what's happening, you know, in the most simplistic form is as we access these, um, you know, old memories and things like that that got stored negatively or disassociated, the brain, there's a model called the triune brain model where the brain kind of evolved in three ways, your body-based brain, your emotional brain, your cognitive brain. So she just developed, Francine Shapiro, the developer, a simple way to just to get access and focus on those three modes of experience and then start sets of these eye movements, which then stimulates the memory network and starts integrating and activating both sides of the brain. So it's right, left, and, and that's what you're taking. All that stuff that gets dissociated gets stored in the right brain. So it's real chunky and non-integrated. So it starts to form with the left brain and then actually start to make different neural connections where it taps you into positive memory networks, discharges the negative. And I don't care if it was torture, the worst sexual abuse, everything goes to a zero. And there are permanent changes. Working with hundreds of clients, I've not had one client come back to me and say stuff came back up for him. So it sounds like it's very deep and uh, very amazing work. Um, to the client out there or the, protective, the prospective client out there, you're not going to force them to go somewhere they don't want to go in their memory. Nowhere. You can block it at any moment. I mean, okay. uh, anything in therapy, I wouldn't want anyone to go anywhere that they didn't want to go. That's up to them to set the agenda to say what they want to work on, what they're ready to work on. Um, as a therapist, I don't want anyone to do anything. Right. I'm cool with them the way they walk in the door. They tell me, hey, John, I'd like to get help with this. I don't have any green light until they say that. So if anything, there's times I'm slowing people down yeah. and saying, let's do a little more build up before we okay. go to that. Good, you know? good. So that, that should allay any fears to people out there who say, gee, that EMDR sounds good, but uh, it sounds a little scary. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have been experienced with John and knowing John for a long time. Everything is comfortable and safe always, and he makes that a priority so that he's going to help you go where you want to go, not where he thinks you should go. And for me, the one of the things I've learned as somebody who specializes in trauma is how to break it into really small pieces. And so, I mean, 99% of the time my clients are saying, that, that was it? Okay, I could do that. You know, I want them to look forward to coming back in, not going, oh, my God, i got to go back in there and yes. dredge all this stuff up. You know? Very good. Excellent. All right, we're going to take a quick break and be right back with the incredible John Hawkins. Stand by. Just waiting for a sound effect on that one. <laughs> of America, your partner in recovery. Treatment Partners of America is a unique, state-of-the-art substance abuse facility. Our trained professionals first focus on finding the core issues in trauma that lead to addiction. With some of the best doctors, nurses, and behavioral health techs the industry has to offer. We offer personalized one-on-one -on -one therapy five days a week, raising the bar to a higher level of standards. Whether it's drugs, alcohol, eating disorders, gambling, sex and love addiction, or even relationship addiction, Treatment Partners of America has specialists to treat and to help heal your addiction long-term rather than attempt a temporary 30-day quick fix. Welcome back to the show. Uh, we have today John Hawkins, the extraordinary EMDR therapist. John, it's great hanging out with you. Uh, I do see you almost every day. <laughs> and, um, you know, this is a lot of knowledge for not just Dr. Joe and myself, but everyone else that's out there because this is groundbreaking therapy that you're doing. And we see it firsthand every day from our clients at Treatment Partners that come up to us and say, you know what? That was the greatest session I've ever had. Or, 
you know, I feel like I'm on the right path now because I sat down with John, had a session, and I never knew like that can come out of me. And I feel like a weight's been lifted off my shoulders. And I'm sure there's so many people right now listening to this going, you know what, I wish I can get rid of what happened or put it in the spot where it needs to be and start living my life. Because we do see a, a lot here at TPA who have died uh, um, dual diagnosis yeah, yeah. Right. where you know people do come in with substance abuse problems and uh, you know trauma. And everyone has trauma in their life at one time or another. There's something mm-hmm. that's going on. And for you to go in there and bring that out of someone and have them feel totally different is incredible. It, re- it really is. What do you see, let's say, the response rate that's out there right now with the EMDR therapy? Um, as far as, like, the successful outcomes? Or? Absolutely, yeah. If somebody stays in treatment with me, they're going to complete those goals. You know, my clients that do the best, they just don't quit. They, they continue. We may do a whole session, and I want to quit. And, you know, it is it is a really rewarding and humbling experience to see somebody in one session transcend something they've been dealing with for 20 years and you know to clients i say everything goes to a zero and nothing that feels bad is ever the last step and so in the i'm completely 100 percent confident they're going to get there because it's not so much me it's the their own internal resources and the way that we're just wired to go towards health it will it will resolve itself is this something that they can also reinforce on our own later in life there is um, the developer in 2012 finally wrote a book for clients called Getting Past Your Past. And that's something that has a lot of understanding and anecdotal stories, as well as some self help EMDR techniques that people can use um, underneath, like needing something to come to somebody like me for where they can process some things. Right, right. You know. So, John, what if a client's had um, a history? of seeing psychiatrists and being on all kinds of meds and being told that they have a serious co-occurring disorder in addition to their addiction. Can those people get treated also? Definitely. I mean, having a mental illness will not preclude you from, you know, treatment from EMDR. There are certain situations, let's say somebody has a severe bipolar disorder where, you know, I'm going to be conscious of triggering any mania for them. But I would tell you, as somebody who specializes in trauma, that the mental health has a massive amount of misdiagnosis. In complex trauma, when we disassociate so many things throughout you know, childhood abuse and, and adolescence, the biggest thing I see misdiagnosed is, is it as bipolar disorder. Because when you're triggering and shifting in, out of all these trauma parts, it looks very erratic. And then people just say, well, that's bipolar because you're having these shifts. And then they get put on bipolar medication. I mean, obviously, there's legitimate bipolar, but then it doesn't, uh, unless you know how to differentiate that, they don't get the proper treatment, and they've been to therapy for 20 years with up and down experiences and never really gotten the quality of treatment that they need to resolve those issues. So EMDR is a good therapy for bipolar disorder? For anything, because if you look at mental health symptoms, they're just like addiction, they're triggered predominantly by stress, by dysregulated affect or you know, emotion. And so when you can start to integrate and resolve those things, you're building up a, comp- a person's capacity, clearing trauma from their nervous system. And so there's not as many things that are vulnerabilities for triggering their, their mental illness. Good. That's a good sound, John. <laughs> rookie rookie <All> mistake. Right. <laughs> Great. So um, how would someone uh, begin to prepare themselves for EMDR? Let's say they're saying, wow, this stuff sounds great, and I've been in therapy for a long time, being a psychiatrist. Geez, I wonder, uh, I wonder if this would work for me. What would you recommend for a client to prepare themselves to participate in EMDR therapy? Um, really nothing. Just make an appointment and come on in. Okay. I mean, right. like I said, we don't just jump off the high dive, but it's, you know, I my clients know, even the ones that, that ask for homework. I'm not really one of those type of therapists, and I'd say the be nice to yourself this week. You'll have your hands full with that. Right. But it's really just kind of a casual sit down, come in, meet me, you know, yeah. we'll curiously start to see what's going on with you, and then collaboratively develop some objectives to work on 
um, so really there's not a any preparation or anything that kind of takes place in those initial sessions. Sure. What's, what's good about substance abuse treatment these days is that we've embraced EMDR as a legitimate form of therapy throughout your chemical dependency treatment. So if you're struggling with an addiction disorder and you have some co-occurring emotional stuff that's been bothering you for years, uh, seeking out some codependency and some chemical dependency treatment may very well expose you to EMDR and may be able to have you benefit from that added therapy while you're in here treating your compulsive behaviors? Definitely, and I think, I mean, my, in addition to working with trauma addiction, my passion currently, and I think we're on the cusp of that, is to really revolutionize and change the way we do treatment. It's been archaic. I mean, with all due respect to everybody, I'm not saying there's not dedicated people or some things aren't beneficial. We've primarily been using a covered wagon when we have, you know, Ferraris and, and things like that. And but people have are married to their approaches like religions, and so they don't want to accept change. A lot of times, we have so many amazing treatment modalities that can totally revolutionize what we do in treatment. I think people are finally starting to come around and, and being more and more open. Where for me, when I first got into working with addiction, you would have I didn't realize there was this kind of an antagonistic relationship between therapists and and twelve steps where it was, you know, therapists weren't as educated a lot of times about the 12-step model and all that. And then there would be sponsors who would say, all you got to do is work the steps. Right. And that's not going to resolve your trauma or raise your serotonin or work on your attachment issues. So it's not a matter of choice, choosing one or the other. It's about integrating both. And now I, I see a lot of sponsors, I get a lot of their sponsees, because they realize there's specific things for me that I can benefit that are not going to get from that, like you wouldn't go to work the steps to cure something in your foot or cancer, right? Sure. So these are biological, you know, neurological related issues. We don't have to guess with all these complicated theories about addiction now. We know from the bottom up what is happening through neuroscience. Like there's this emotions or biochemical energy. There's this dysregulated stuff come flying through and we grab whatever we can to cope, survive and regulate. Okay, um, you mentioned a, a term earlier that I know is a big buzzword in the uh, addiction field today, and that's attachment. Um, a lot of emphasis on attachment disorders, unresolved attachment. Can you explain to the public out there a little bit about this latest research on the term attachment? Um, attachment has really been, uh, again, as neuroscience has really identified a lot of these things, some of it's come full circle where... When we're infants, you know, our sense of self, our ability to regulate our emotions is developed through our primary caregivers. They have to be able to tolerate that emotion, reflect it, help us integrate it. And so that's probably a bit of a rare thing to sufficiently get. So that starts that process immediately where we start disassociating things. So then a person's left with all these, you know, split off parts of themselves, which are, again, neural networks that just get kind of wired in different ways and not integrated and as a therapist, you're kind of going back in and trying to repair that and complete that as a, an attachment, substitute attachment figure, where you can handle their emotions, you can help them reintegrate them, develop a whole sense of self. There's a, a gentleman out of Atlanta named Philip Flores, and he's got a book called Addiction as an Attachment Disorder. And so really, if you look at a lot of times – in a lot of cases, what addiction is doing is it's substituting as an attachment figure. If I have a secure attachment, I can reach for somebody. They can help me regulate these feelings, um, lower my anxiety, and get to a good place. When I can't do that, I have to reach for something else to achieve the same thing. And, you know, most people coming into treatment have trauma, have trust issues for very legitimate reasons. So there's a lot of blocks to attachment. It's, it gets risky for people, right? I mean, if my primary caregiver has abused me or somebody abandoned me, it's not so easy just to reach for attachment and be vulnerable, you know, and, and that really needs to be identified and addressed. You know, in some cases, drugs save people's lives. I've had clients where I would say heroin saved their life, that they had so much trauma, there's no doubt in my mind they would have committed suicide without that substance. So I want to validate that and de-shame that and help them get better resources now. 
That's great. We use EMDR as an integral part of our treatment program here at Treatment Partners of America. What we also use is daily one-on-one -on -one sessions, which is unique in the field of substance abuse treatment. So we talk about this attachment disorder and trying to resolve attachment issues, trying to form new healthy attachments. Well, when you're seeing your therapist every day one-on-one, -on -one, that helps with that attachment. Wouldn't you think so, John? Definitely. I mean, so to work through some of those trust issues, to be able to, to reintegrate this stuff and process emotions that we had to split off, you have to do that in the context of a secure attachment. So if you're seeing your therapist 15 minutes a week, four times while you're in treatment, you can't typically create an attachment right. that's sufficient to go into these painful feelings. So, true. so it's so crucial, you know, what we do here of having a more dedicated time where people can build that attachment to do what they need to do now to get to a completion. Because without that, you're dead in the water. Right. And you, right. you feel that makes a big difference, John, with the one-on-ones? Definitely. I mean, you know, there's a lot of group therapy is powerful, but there's a lot of things that are, you know, people just aren't ready to share in a group yet or to be able to be in a safe environment and really start to connect with a therapist, build that trust, start to be able then to go into these places where there was unbearable aloneness when these feelings came the first time. You what, know? what would you say to someone out there that's struggling right now? I would say, you know, doing this work and working with so many clients is anything you've been through can be healed. There is nothing, no matter what you do to us as human beings, there's a core, it may go deep down inside, but it is 100% intact. And it's just amazing and humbling to see people's capacity to heal. You just need safe enough relationships and the right help and you can overcome anything. That, that's yeah. that's incredible. That's very, great. Very good stuff. What do you think the next step is for EMDR in the future? Where do you see it going? Uh, well, one of the next steps has come, has already came where there was a well-known EMDR therapist named David Grand, and he developed a new model called brain spotting, which is kind of an evolution of it. So it's tapping into the same system. I would say it goes even deeper into the brain, and it's a little more rapid. So. You know, I'll eat, kind of integrate both of those a lot of the times with clients where you can fluidly weave in and out. I'm hoping with, you know, what we're doing and, and getting out, trying to expose people to it, that it can be, become a much more prominent part of treatment. With, when I was mentioning earlier, like when you first use a substance, like maybe the first time I use IV heroin use or do cocaine or have some intense sexual experience, that's an intense emotional memory. So the brain really marks that. And then what happens is, especially if there was a deficit in some need you had that's a core need as a human being, the brain works on associations like peanut butter jelly and it locks in on that. So the subcortical brain won't learn something new that there's other ways to get that need met. So if I was, if I like a loser my whole life and I go down to the hard rock and I hit a big pot, I feel special, I feel like I'm a winner, I'm important. Now I can't stop compulsive gambling. I'm not stupid. I know that my wife's going to divorce me and right. I'm going through all my finances, but I can't stop. Once you help a client identify that, you can break that within minutes. And now their brain is open to new learning. And usually what the underlying negative belief or trauma was will surface right then and you can process it. All right, we're going to take another quick break and we'll be back to wrap it up with John Hawkins. So everybody uh, just stand by. We'll see you in a minute. For me, seeing a client enter and then go through the whole program and graduate is the most rewarding feeling one could ever have. Clients need physical, social, spiritual, mental, and intellectual knowledge. I get to see the miracle and the change within a client from the time that they come in uh, till the time they discharge. We are Treatment Partners of America. Your partner in recovery. Welcome back to Sober Smash, and our guest today is John Hawkins. Uh, John is an EMDR therapist. He runs the whole program at Treatment Partners of America. Great, great person, and great responses he's getting from the therapy that he's providing. Um, 
John, let's let's talk about the attachment and codependency at the same time. Really, um, is it the same? Um, this is a topic that I really enjoy talking about because in recovery, dependency has gotten a really bad rap. That we need healthy dependency from cradle to grave. We're wired for dependency. Healthy dependency is good. We need to attach to people. Now, obviously, it can get out of bounds, but you know, it's you cannot heal, you cannot recover without healthy <laughs> dependency. So you need to be able to securely attach to people. In that book, um, Addiction as an Attachment Disorder, it's the best work I've ever read on the integration of therapy in the 12 steps. So you cannot heal outside of a relational context because you need to be able to securely attach to people to then regulate those feelings, but to also develop. I mean, life is hard, right? You cannot live in isolation. I mean, we have to have people that we know are going to pick up the phone at three in the morning or they're going to be there, that we're going to be there for them. And we're wired for connection biologically. And it's something we need. And so as long as those things are unrepaired, I mean, a common client for me would be a sponsor who's got three or five years of recovery, who's hit every financial goal they've had, has achieved everything they wanted, and they're completely depressed and have no sense of meaning in their life. So they roll into my office, and every single time, it's the exact same issue. They cannot securely connect to people, whether it's because of shame or trauma. Or got a question here. This is a little odd. This is Jonathan NYC. He's asking, does EMDR work on a blind person? Uh, yes, you can do it with EMDR because wow. what, what you're working with is the bilateral stimulation of the left and right brain. So you can create, you can still get eye movements from someone. Um, the eye movements are the most effective, but the other forms of bilateral stimulation um, will achieve pretty good results as well, like auditory pings or tapping. Um, I've worked, probably the youngest client I've done EMDR with was like four and what I did with them was basically almost like a patty cake thing where they were getting the bilateral stimulation through us. I had them think about what it was that was causing them distress, and then we processed it in that way. Same thing with brain spotting. is As long as somebody can move their eye, you can find a spot where they sense the most feeling, even if they can't visually see much. The, also, does EMDR apply to areas besides drug addiction? or any type of substance abuse? What other areas? Um, one of the things that has been really successful for me is working with people with chronic pain. So everything's experienced in the brain, sight, smell, taste, touch. What I have found with probably 75% of the chronic pain cases I've worked on is it will immediately start going to traumas. It could be getting hit by a baseball when I was five. It could be a car wreck I was in. It, you know, Things that people don't connect or associate with their pain. Fibromyalgia is a completely trauma-based experience. You know, you go to a physician, they say you have fibromyalgia, which is basically saying you have pain that we don't know anything about. Every case I've worked on fibromyalgia has cleared out to a zero. Things like irritable, you know, with trauma, some of the biggest thing I'll see is a lot of somatic symptoms. Irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, a lot of these things where the nervous system had to over-regulate you know, to kind of keep a lot of that stuff down. ADD, there's legitimate ADD, but I can't tell you how many cases of ADD when we process the trauma, the person has no trouble focusing. Because your brain, when you disassociate that material, that part of your brain does not know that event is not happening anymore 30 years later. So you imagine like trying to take a test with a gun to your head, it's gonna be hard to concentrate, right. you know? How do psychiatrists feel towards EMDR, the therapy? You know, like some doctors might look down on chiropractors or acupuncturists and say, you know what, you're hurting our industry, you're embarrassing us. It's not real medicine. I think that was the way in the beginning, and I can understand skepticism because there is so much crazy stuff that comes out in this field. Now I would say the vast majority um, advocate it will send me clients and because there's just so much research that you can't ignore. And you'll get a fringe person here or there right. that says like, oh, but it, I think most of the time their views about a lot of things are like that. So I would say within the community of therapists, psychiatrists, it's pretty much an indisputable thing now with the amount of research that's come out on it. Well, now you have a proven track record also. You have so yeah. much data where before, you know, people were skeptical because it was the unknown. 
Yeah. Clinicians were saying, hey, this is happening, and researchers were saying, prove it. But I think, again, that even those two uh, have been merging as time has gone on in therapy, where right. rather than being oppositional to each other, it's more of a collaboration now saying, yeah, we want to prove what we're seeing. And researchers are more open-minded to say, well, we'll, we'll see, we'll prove it or disprove it with you, but we won't just be antagonistic to you. Great. Well, John, it's been great speaking with you this afternoon. Um, I hope a lot of people got you know, a lot out of this as Dr. Joe and I, I have, and uh, you've been sober smashed. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs>